Alright, how's everybody doing today? Back again with another video for you guys and gals. And today, what I have for everyone is my full review of the Motorola Moto G7 or the whole Motorola lineup for 2019. So maybe you're new to the channel or maybe you're returning, but typically how my review process works is I shoot my unboxing and first impressions video, then my review process starts. And once I feel like I got a handle on everything that I want to talk about and cover with you guys and gals, then it's full review time. So without further ado, let's jump into this full review of a nice little selection of devices coming out of Motorola's camp this year. Let's go. Now, starting off, the first thing I want to talk about with you guys and gals is the overall build quality and design of the devices themselves. Now, build quality wise, I have to say Motorola has done a great job here. There's no rattling or creaking of any kind. All of the buttons give you a nice clicky and responsive feedback to them. And they feel really good in the hands. So really, really good stuff there, Motorola. And in terms of the overall build quality, no issues whatsoever. Now, talking about the overall design, again, I have to say Motorola has done a good job here. I do like this overall design, especially the, where they place the camera module. I feel like the camera module itself gives the design some overall function, uh, personality as well as still maintaining its functionality. So that's really, really good. And I also like the fact that they were able to bake in a always active fingerprint sensor underneath the Motorola logo. So not only do you have brand recognition with that Motorola logo, but it also does serve dual functionality purposes because it's also your dedicated fingerprint sensor that's always active. So really, really good design choices in my opinion really really good build quality overall now if there was one gripe that i have with the overall build quality and design that would probably be the fact that they have a glass device just for the sake of trying to make their device look cool they don't incorporate any wireless charging or waterproofing so this just serves to make the device a very slippery beast and a case is almost mandatory if you're deciding between which Motorola device you want to pick up. So that is the only downside that I found with the overall build quality and design of this device. So other than that, the overall build quality and design is really, really good. The device has a nice balance weight in the hand and it also feels very good in the hand. So good stuff there. Moving on now, the next thing I want to talk about with you guys and gals is the overall display across the lineup here. Okay, so in particular with this model here that you guys see in the video, the regular Moto G7 has a 6.2 inch IPS LCD display, which is Gorilla Glass 3 and the whole device is made with Gorilla Glass 3 on the front and the back. In particular, when we talk about the display, the regular and the plus variants of the Moto G7 lineup have 1080p displays. The regular version, which is what y'all see here, is a 6.2 inch display with a resolution of 1080p by 2270, which gives it an overall screen density of 405 pixels per inch. For you guys and gals that wanted to know the technical specs, and the same thing applies to the G7 Plus. All right. Now, the differences across the lineup. If you go down in the lineup to the Motorola G7 Power, you get a slightly bigger display at 6.4 inches, but it's a lower resolution 720p display. Okay. And if you go down even further to the Play Edition, you get a slightly smaller a uh, 5.7 inch IPS LCD display also at 720p. All right. But the main differences in display across the lineup are in the regular play in plus versus the power. The power has the bigger, more iPhone 10 style notch, whereas the plus, the regular and the play 
all implement your teardrop style notch there, which you can turn off in the developer option setting if you don't like that sort of thing. But I just wanted to point out these differences. Other than that, now let's talk, talk about using the display in daily usage. I have to say in daily usage, this is an okay display. Now outdoors, I found that I have to keep it at max brightness to even be able to see it, even decently see it, it has to be kept at max brightness. Indoors at moderate lightning, lighting and lower lighting, I have to keep it anywhere from about 60 to 70% and then I'm able to see it comfortably. But in really low lighting, I found that there's a little bit of a clarity issue. So the, the display just doesn't seem that clear to me in really low lighting. Now I've tried to tinker around with the display settings, but Motorola doesn't really offer too much granular controls in terms of controlling the display. So you're kind of stuck with what they give you. But all in all, I'd have to say the display is not good. The display, the display is not great. It just gets the job done, so it's okay. And honestly, I feel like the display on the Moto G6 from last year was a slightly better display. Keep in mind, that's just in my opinion. All right, so that covers the display. Now let's keep it moving. Up next now, let's dive into the hardware across the lineup and then talk about my overall experiences with the software. So let's do this. Hardware wise, across the lineup, you got a nice little selection of hardware. So with your regular G7 and your G7 Plus, you get four gigs of RAM and 64 gigs of onboard storage. You get a 30, a uh, 30, a 3000 milliamp hour battery, also on board, you get a micro SD card, which you can use as adaptable, expandable storage. So you can make your micro SD card internal storage. Really good stuff there. With the regular and the plus, you get a dual rear facing camera setup, a 12 and 5 setup in the rear, which is capable of recording uh, 4K video, 1080p, 1080p 60 and 720p 120 frames per second slow motion. As I said, you do get a nice always active fingerprint sensor, which works almost every time. So really, really good stuff there. All the models this year support USB type C, a bottom firing speaker and a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. They all support an eight megapixel front facing camera as well, even though their display sizes may vary. So there is that. And in particular, when we dive in deeper into the hardware um, with, the, uh, with the regular, the play and the power, you're getting the exact same chipset across the board. So you're getting the Snapdragon 632 octa-core chipset with an Adreno 506 GPU. Where they differ in the lineup is with the power, you're getting slightly less RAM. So you're getting three gigs of RAM and 32 gigs of onboard storage in the US globally unlocked model. Now, if you go with the international model of the power, you do get the four gigs of RAM and 64 gigs of onboard storage, the same as you would get on the regular and the plus, but you lose out on some of the bands and it then becomes a GSM only unlock device whereas if you go with the us globally unlocked variants it'll work across all the major carriers so there is that now if you bump down to the play you have a slightly smaller display but you get two gigs of ram and 16 gigs of onboard storage or uh two gigs of ram and 32 gigs of onboard storage you still got the same 3000 milliamp hour battery and you also lose one camera on the power and the play. So you're downgraded to one singular uh, 13 megapixel rear facing camera on the power and the play. Okay. But you do get the drops in price tag, which we're going to talk about later. And in particular with the power, you get that 5,000 milliamp hour battery, which is going to give you battery life for days 
in comparison to the others in the lineup. So that's a little bit of the hardware differences across the Moto G7 lineup this year. Another big difference is that if you go with the Plus variant, you're gonna upgrade the processor to the Snapdragon 660. Everything else stays the same. So all the devices this year can record in 4K and do 1080p, 60, 30, and 720p slow motion with the front and the rear facing cameras, okay? The front facing cameras on all of the devices this year max out at a maximum recording resolution of 1080p at 30 frames per second. So that pretty much goes over all the hardware across the lineup. Now, let's dive a little bit deeper into my experiences with the software, all right? Now, software-wise, the whole lineup this year is running the exact same implementation of the software with no features being skimped out upon. So you do have your Motorola launcher with your Motorola UI. Now, I'm not gonna dive deep into the software because I've done a separate dedicated software walkthrough, which I'll link up in the cards and link down below in the video description. So if y'all want a more in-depth look and or walkthrough of the software and features on the Motorola devices, feel free to check that out. That being said, talking about my experiences with the software, I have to say Motorola has done a great job with this one. They finally managed to get rid of that little bit of hiccup and or stutter that their previous devices used to suffer from. The whole experience is very fluid and fast, and I've had no issues with the software aside from the general Android issues. So with a, a ton of apps open in the background, you will get that occasional app hiccup and or stutter. And if you're doing things like graphically intensive gaming, you will maybe experience the occasional app crash if you load up the, uh, the RAM all the way. So it is possible to max out the RAM on this device, then you will start to see uh, performance issues. But if you're mindful of what apps you have open and you're mindful of your available RAM, you should have an enjoyable experience. So the overall software experience, in my opinion, on this device is pretty, pretty good. I haven't had no issues aside from that stuff that I already mentioned. All right. So the hardware is top notch and the software is pretty good. Pretty good indeed. Now, moving on, let's talk about the Wi-Fi and the Wi-Fi performance on this device and across the lineup. So Wi-Fi wise, we have support for dual band Wi-Fi, which means we have support for 2.4 gigahertz band Wi-Fi and 5 gigahertz band Wi-Fi. In particular, that means we have support for Wi-Fi 802.11 BGNN and AC. And in terms of the overall Wi-Fi performance, I have to say this device has done a great job. Wi-Fi speeds and data speeds have been phenomenal and I haven't had any issues and I've t tested this across a bunch of carriers, some of which we're gonna get into in a little bit, but in terms of the overall Wi-Fi speeds, I had no issues, all right? Now, let me go ahead and give y'all a Wi-Fi performance test and that will also double as a speaker test as well. So let's rewind this because I was listening to this earlier and let's max out the volume and let's go. All right, make sure that volume's at 100%, it is. And I'm gonna let this play for a little bit so y'all can get an idea of the speaker performance and the Wi-Fi performance. And then I'm gonna talk to y'all about how I feel about the overall speaker performance and placement. So enjoy, guys and gals. Angle up the mic here. All right, nice and close, and let's push play.
All right, let's go through the video now. That does it for the Wi-Fi performance test, and it also does it for the real quick speaker test as well. Now, how do I feel about the onboard speaker on this device? Well, I have to say in terms of the general performance, it's a pretty good speaker, all right? So it gets very loud and stays very crisp and clear throughout, all right, with no distortion on the low or the high ends. So really good speaker in that regard. And I do have to say, it is a vastly better speaker than some of the other devices that I have, like my V30 and or my S8 or my Google Pixel XL first generation. The speaker performance on the Moto G7 vastly outperforms all of those speakers, okay? Really good stuff there. Because on the other devices, I do find that I have to run it at higher volumes to get similar speaker performance. Whereas I could run this one at 50% volume and it will sound the same. I could run it at 30% volume and it will sound the same. And I could run it at max volume and it will sound the same. So really good overall speaker performance on the Moto G7 series. And it greatly out, outperforms the other devices that I own. So really good stuff there. That being said, in terms of the overall speaker placement, you guys and gals know I'm not a big fan of the bottom firing speaker placement. I'm an advocate for front firing speakers. In my opinion, that's where the speakers need to be. That way they're harder to obstruct and or block and you don't have to engage in cupping gymnastics. It just is what it is. And honestly, I was a little bit sad to see that Motorola stepped away from the thing. One of the things that I feel made them popular back in the day, even up to the G6, Motorola was known for always having front firing speakers or a speaker. And even in their older devices like the X series or the, the Pure Edition series or the Z series and earlier generations of the G series, they always had front firing speakers. So I was very sad to see that this year they decided to bump that and go with the more modern approach that every other device is going with, with the bottom firing speaker. Okay. They could have at least took it a step further and did what the flagship devices are doing this year and give me a front facing speaker and the receiver and an, a bottom firing speaker there. Some form of dual firing speaker setup would have been greatly appreciated. So I'm kind of bummed out about that, but it is what it is. The device is already out. Maybe for the next year, they'll do a dual, uh, dual speaker setup. They'll bring that back. It is what it is. But so I'm not a big fan of the speaker placement, but overall the Wi-Fi performance and general speaker performance is really good. Now, moving on, the next thing I want to cover with you guys and gals is the overall LTE bands supported across the lineup. Now, in terms of LTE bands, I'm very happy to report that regardless of whatever device you go with in the lineup, it's going to be globally unlocked. So that means that it will have support for all of your US major carriers and all GSM carriers and all GSM carriers abroad as well. And as you can see up on the screen, feel free to pause and read for yourself. The only LTE band that we're missing on our D7 series is band 71. Now that may differ because if you pick up a carrier branded version, then that band might be included. So if you go with the T-Mobile uh, variant, if they sell it in the T-Mobile store, you might have that band 71. 
and so on and so forth. But at least if you pick up the globally unlocked variant, you're not going to have Band 71. And in my opinion, the device functions perfectly fine, 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 even without that band. So it is what it is. And I also want to point out, as I did earlier, if you decide to go with the international version of the G7 Power, then you're only going to have a GSM unlocked device. So if you pick up the international version where you will have the extra gig of RAM and the double storage, you will lose out on the additional bands and it will only work on GSM carriers like T-Mobile and AT&T and any of their MVNOs. So Cricket, Metro by T-Mobile, so on and so forth. So if you pick up the international variant of, of that device, it will not work on carriers like Sprint and or Verizon. That being said, if you go with the globally unlocked variant, you should work across all of the major platforms. Now, I can um, back that up because I did test this device on T-Mobile, Verizon, and AT&T. For those of you who don't know, I have T-Mobile through TextNow, I have Verizon through Straight Talk, and I have AT&T through Free Up Mobile. All right, and I was actually able to test this device on all of those networks and it worked without issue. So if you check out some of my older videos, you can see that I'm actually running different carriers. And right now I can verify that it's running on T-Mobile, no problem, as y'all can see there in the video. So I can verify that it works across those carriers without issues. Now, I don't have Sprint at the moment and I do have to let you guys and gals know that previous Moto devices did have issues getting activated on Sprint and me myself, I can verify that because when I got rid of my Moto G6, the person that it ended up going to did have some issues getting it to activate on Sprint. Now they got it to work, but there was some additional hoops that they had to jump through. So I just wanted to point that out. But in terms of the overall LTE band supported, you guys should be good to go. All right, so good stuff in that category. Next, now let's talk about the overall Bluetooth performance in this bad boy. Let's do it. Now, Bluetooth wise, this bad boy is packing the older Bluetooth connectivity in it. So we got Bluetooth 4.2 technology in this one. So it's not the newest, but in terms of the overall performance, I got to tell you guys and gals, I've had no issues with overall Bluetooth performance and I've connected up just about everything. I've done speakers, I've done my shutter button, I've done other phones, I've done headphones, all that good stuff, earbuds, and the overall Bluetooth performance on this device is really, really good. So no issues in regards to the onboard Bluetooth module. All right, so good stuff there. Next. Let's talk about another category that's really important to me. Let's talk about the overall GPS performance. Let me go ahead and pull up my last screenshot here. Boom. Okay, where's that? Right there. Okay, so in terms of the overall GPS performance, again, I have to say that this device has done a great job. Whether I was doing things like turn-by-turn -turn navigation or geocaching and geotagging, didn't have any issues with the GPS on this device. So that's really, really good, especially for me because I'm very GPS dependent and I use my GPS regularly on a daily basis. Okay, so if you're GPS dependent like myself, you should have no issues if you're trying to decide to pick up this device. So top notch marks in the GPS category. Let's go. Now, moving on, the next thing I want to talk about with you guys and gals is the overall call quality and speaker call quality on this device. Now, call quality wise, again, as I've stated, I tested it on T-Mobile, I tested it on AT&T, and I tested it on Verizon. And in my opinion, uh, Verizon and AT&T were the best in terms of call quality. T-Mobile wasn't bad, but I didn't get the best reception based on my coverage area. And that's one thing you wanna keep in mind when um, we're talking about call quality, Two things that greatly impact it is coverage area <clears throat> and then the hardware, okay? 
So the hardware I found no issues with. Calls were very loud, crisp, and clear, either through the built-in receiver or the onboard speaker. So didn't have any issues with phone calls. And it's really, really nice to see that, especially considering that Motorola has went ahead and implemented the Dolby Atmos speaker boost technology on this. And when you don't have a Bluetooth headset connected, it's the speaker boost technology is always on. So when you're in phone calls, you should have a really good experience. And I can attest to that. I had a really good experience while taking phone calls. And the same rules apply for video calls as well. So call quality and speaker call quality are top notch on this device. Next, now let's talk about my overall experiences with the cameras on this device. Now, if you want a more in-depth look at the cameras, including a camera walkthrough, the, all the photo and video samples that I was able to capture with this device, feel free to check out my camera walkthrough, which I'll link up in the cards and I'll also link it down below in the video description. For this review video right here, I'm just going to give you my overall impressions and my overall opinion. Okay. So when we talk about the cameras on the Moto G7, I have to say in terms of the photo quality, you are able to get some really good photos regardless of the lighting. Now you do need good lighting to take a decent photo. But all in all, through my experience, I was able to capture some really good photos and I didn't have any issues with the photo performance. I did, however, notice that in my opinion, I feel like the Moto G6 has slightly better cameras for things when it comes like comes to like the edge detection for portrait mode. I feel like the Moto G6 was slightly better at that. But overall, you are able to take some really good photos with this device, whether it be through the rear facing camera or the front facing camera. And the same rules apply for video. So I was able to capture some really good video with this device, whether it be 4K video, whether it be 1080p video, whether it was slow motion, I captured some really great video with this device. That being said, I did notice that the video processing for 4K video or 2K video was a little bit off. When I took the raw footage and tried to put it into my editing software or any, any editing software for that matter, the phone kept spitting out error messages. So at least when you're trying to render and or edit 4K video, the phone may give you some issues. But I didn't see any issues with 720p or 1080p footage. So you are able to capture some really great, great video footage with this device, just as long as you're mindful that you may run into some issues with 4K or 2K coverage. Okay, that being said, also when we talk about the audio recording of this device, uh, it's okay. It's not the best and nine times out of 10, I found myself wanting to go back and do a voiceover for my videos or go back and reshoot the video with a dedicated microphone plugged in. So the audio on this Motorola definitely needs to improve the onboard microphone quality on this device. Okay. Definitely need to improve that and definitely need to improve that of there. Definitely need to work on your audio recording Motorola. But other than that, the overall camera experience was pretty good. Pretty good indeed. All right. Next, the next thing I want to go over is the general gaming experience. Now, I've also done a separate dedicated gaming performance video. So feel free to check that out. Again, we'll link it up in the cards and we'll throw it down below in the video description. If you want to see how this device performs for yourself, feel free to check that out. All in all, I have to say, um, as long as I was mindful of the uh, apps that I had in memory, the overall gaming experience was really, really good. Now it does suffer from some heating issues. It did get quite warm while I was playing across the back in the fingerprint sensor area, but the overall gaming performance did not degrade as long as I was mindful of the apps that I had running in the background. So the overall gaming experience, at least in my opinion, was really good. So good stuff there. Now, 
Moving on, the next thing I want to go over is I want to briefly touch on the synthetic benchmarks and the benchmark scores. Now, I'm only doing this because you guys won't let me take it out. I've been asking y'all for months and months. Do y'all care about the uh, benchmarking performance scores? And I just, crickets, I've been hearing crickets. But as long as y'all don't say nothing, I have to keep including it because I know there is a particular crowd out there that like to see the synthetic benchmark scores. At least for me, those days are gone because I feel like manufacturers have finally figured out the right combination of hardware and software which equates to a smooth and fluid user experience and at the end of the day that's all i care about as an end user as long as i have that smooth and enjoyable user experience i can care less what the, the synthetic benchmark numbers say and honestly this device does a great job in regards to the fluidity of it but let's go ahead and run through these synthetic benchmark scores so this right here is the Ice Storm Unlimited Test from 3D Mark, and you can see the Moto G7 scored a 14,559. So not bad, not the best, but not bad. This is the Antutu benchmark scores, and you can see the Moto G7 scored a 106,549, and it defeated 19% of the other devices that use this test. So again, not the best, but not bad, all right? And it continues as we go through the benchmark scores. So Geekbench 4, uh, 1,232 single core, 4,309 multi-core, not the best, but not bad, all right? So y'all can see where I'm going with this. Uh, Geekbench 4 compute test, again, 3,701, not the best, but not bad. Go ahead. Insert the lines for me. Ready? This is the Valemo uh, metal test. And as you can see, it scored a very respectable score of 2,535. Now, the only reason why I still include these benchmarks is because I like to see how the newer devices stack up to the older devices. And as you can see, it didn't max out the test, but it still scored top of the pack. So what do we say? Okay, moving on. Then we have the Valemo multi-core test. And again, it scored top of the pack and got a very respectable score of 2,746. But it got bested by the Samsung Galaxy S6. Was very surprised to see that, but still a pretty good score. All right, moving on now. This is my favorite benchmark to run because this is how I can tell if you got some really good hardware and how good the overall multitasking is aside from using the device on the, the daily. So this is the Discomark multitasking benchmark. And what this benchmark does is as the name implies, it lets me load up any number of apps that I want and it cycles through those apps and it spits out an average time that the device took to get through all those apps and then it spits out the average loading time for each individual app. So as y'all can see, the Moto G7 here scored a very respectable time of 4.497 seconds and the individual app load up times were pretty good as well. So really good stuff, really good stuff indeed. All right, and I do believe that goes through all the benchmark scores. So now let's keep it moving, let's do this. Now, moving on now, the next thing that I wanna talk about with you guys and gals is the overall battery life and the overall charge times. Now, before I jump into the overall battery life and I show you guys and gals my results, I do wanna point out that something strange happened while I was testing this device. Now, I put the device through the standard discharge recharge cycle. So you should do about four to five standard full discharge recharge cycles to prime the battery. And then I started using the device and it only stayed at 100% for about a couple days. And this is very weird because I have older devices and I, I condition and use my devices all the same way. So I have older devices that I was able to maintain at pristine battery health for a lot longer periods of time. So I was very surprised to see 
how quickly the battery health degraded on the Moto G7. So I just wanted to point that out here, okay? But other than that, jumping into the overall battery life and the overall charge times, in regards to the battery life, I have to point out with my style of heavy usage, I can easily make it through a 12 hour day, no problem. And I'm averaging anywhere from about five and a half hours of screen on time to about eight and a half hours of screen on time. And I was able to get about 10 hours plus screen on time, but in order for me to do that, I had to push the device into the single digit percentages left. And I'm not a big fan of doing that because it degrades the overall life of the device. And it's not like I could run down to the store and pick up new batteries and swap it out because the battery is non-removable. So you really got to exercise some battery maintenance and device maintenance to increase the longevity of your devices nowadays. Sad, but it is what it is. These manufacturers had to come up with some way to get you to go out there and purchase new devices. We couldn't sit with Samsung Galaxy S4s forever because then they wouldn't make any money. But it is what it is. That being said, the overall battery life on this one, in my opinion, is pretty good. Now, the overall charge times, when we get into that, the Motorola lineup of devices, the G7 lineup, all support uh, turbo charging power across the whole lineup. So whether you get the play edition, whether you get the plow, power, power, whether you get the power edition, whether you get the regular edition or the plus, you're going to get the 15 watt fast charging across the whole lineup. And I have to say that this device charges really, really fast. On average, when I was charging to 100, it took anywhere from an hour and a half to an hour and 50 minutes to reach a full charge. And in the rare instances where I didn't charge to 100, it took anywhere from about 25 to 35 minutes to reach my desired charging percentage. So the overall charging speeds with this device and this charging technology are really, really good. And you should have a really enjoyable experience when we come to the charging speeds. So good stuff there. Next. Now we've reached the end of the video, and this is where I'm going to talk to you guys and gals about the price and give you guys and gals my overall final thoughts and a recommendation or two. Now, let me cover the pricing for the whole lineup, and then I'm going to cover the pricing for what I picked up my device for here. So across the lineup, if you go with the Motorola Moto G7 Play, that bad boy is going to run you anywhere from 100 to $150, okay? If you go with the G7 Power, that device is gonna run you anywhere from 200 to $250. If you go with the regular G7, which is what you guys and gals have been seeing in this video, this device is gonna run you anywhere from $250 to about 300 bucks. And if you go with the G7 Plus, that bad boy is going to run you anywhere from about $300 to $350. So Motorola has done a great job of covering all the price tiers in the entry level to budget mid-range. So they got a device for everybody pretty much. That being said, this device that y'all see in this video is the regular model, the regular G7. And this bad boy ran me a little bit over $300 after tax. Now I did pick this up on Amazon and I picked it up through the Amazon Prime payment program. So at checkout, all I had to do was make my first payment and then I'll be doing five easy payments of $60 a month for the next five months. So at checkout, I paid $60 plus tax. So it came up to just the device itself now because I purchased the cases and stuff separately. It came up to about $81, $82 at checkout. So that's not bad. And as I go through, they'll just be pulling off $60 payments for the next four months or so. So not bad at all. And also, I can pay it off at any time as I feel like. All I have to do is go in and click pay remaining balance and we're good. So I can let it run and it'll slowly pay itself off or I can go in at any time and pay off the full remaining balance. So good stuff there. That being said, 
For that price point, you guys and gals are probably wondering, can I recommend that y'all pick up this device? Well, I'd have to say yes and no. Okay? Yes, if you just want a device that's going to work, you want it to be easy to use, and you don't mind the fact that you may have to pick it up through your carrier or on a payment program to get it at a cheaper price. If you're okay with that, and this is going to be your only device for the, for the year or your only device for the next two years, go ahead and get it on the carrier payment program or a payment program in general, and you should be good to go. Specifically, when we do payment programs, I would always recommend either the Amazon Prime payment program or your carrier payment program. Because on the Amazon Prime payment program, you got full Amazon Prime warranty for 30 days, and then you got full U.S. warranty for the life of the device, or however long that warranty states in your user manual. You got to read that and check that out, but that's also available information on Amazon.com. And <clears throat> that also being said, Carrier warranty is a little bit better than that because if you pick it up through a carrier, if you have any issues, you just take it back to the store, they diagnose it, and they determine whether you are at fault or if it was a fault of the device, and then they ship you out a new device or give you a donor unit to repairs on your original device can be made. So this is why I always say if you want to save money and you're okay with doing the payment programs, get it through the carrier or get it through whatever uh, payment program you're comfortable with. That being said, for my unlock community, yeah, stand up. Uh, for us people who like to buy devices unlocked and live that unlock and um, sim unlock lifestyle, can I recommend that you guys go out there and pick this up? Well, I have to say no. For that price point, that $200 to $350 price point, there are a lot of other better devices out there that offer similar, if not the same features with a little bit of extra features that put it head and shoulders above this device, in my opinion. So a few devices that come to mind that I feel may be better than this, keep in mind this is just in my opinion, at similar price points to this, offering better features and or similar features are devices like the uh, new bleep, uh, the new blue devices, in particular the blue 11 plus. That one you get more RAM, you get more storage, you get wireless charging. Sure, you don't have the waterproofing, and the cameras are slightly not as good. But overall, I feel that package is a little bit better. Then we get into devices like the the new Yumi Digi lineup, which you can have at a lot cheaper prices. And you get um, waterproofing, you get wireless charging. Sure, you don't get as good cameras, but you still get the stock, stock software and a few customizable features at a lot cheaper price. And then, to make matters worse, also in this price point, you have the older flagships, okay, with better processors and Slightly worse battery life, but better cameras on the whole. So when I say older flagships, I'm talking about devices like the S8 Plus, the S8, the Note 8, the S9. Um, I'm talking about devices like the OnePlus series, the 3T, the 5T, the 6T, so on and so forth. All right. And all of those devices have slightly better performance, in my opinion. And they do it at the same price. So, can I recommend that you pick this up globally unlocked? No. Okay? And for me, I feel like the only two things that Motorola was missing that made this a no-go recommendation for me, if you want to pick it unlocked, pick it up unlocked, they were missing that full waterproofing. Now, this does have a splash-resistant nano coating. So you can't get it wet, you just can't fully submerge it, okay? So that's kind of bad. I think that's worth $20 right there. So if you would have included that, that bumps the price up to uh, $320. But you didn't include that, so you might as well bump the price down. Same $20. So that brings this price down to $280.
All right, granted, uh, after taxes, when everything is all said and done, this bad boy is going to run me $320-something. I'll have the screenshots up in post so y'all know exactly what it's going to cost me and exactly what it did cost me because y'all know we keep it 100 around here. So, minus that $20 is down to $280. All right, then if they would have threw in wireless charging, that's, that's worth another 30 bucks right there so that brings it up to 350 or down to 250 because they don't have it okay so there you go that's my justifications as to why i would recommend this device and, and as to why i wouldn't recommend this device honestly if you want a motorola device the best recommendation i can do for you the best device in the lineup that balances price to performance, I would recommend you go with the Moto G7 Power or the Moto G7 Power International version. Those are the two models of the device that strike the perfect balance between performance and price. All right, so there y'all go. And before I get up out of here, I do want to let y'all know that I will not have any versus slash comparison videos with this device because I do plan on picking up the uh, Moto G7 Power International variant. And when I do that, then I'll jump head and shoulders into the versus slash comparison videos. So if y'all are going to be on the lookout for that, y'all going to have to wait a little bit longer on that one. So I do apologize. That being said, if you guys and gals enjoyed this video and or found it helpful in any way, shape, form, or fashion, please feel free to give your boy a thumbs up. That really does help me out. You don't know how much. If you want to see more content like this, also feel free to hit the subscribe notification bell icon right next to it so you guys and gals get notified when I publish new videos. That being said, if this video piqued your interest, all the links to where you can pick up this device at some really great prices as well as some recommended accessories, cases, screen protectors, micro SD cards, all that stuff will be available down below in the video description. So. Down below in the video description should be like a one-stop shop for you guys and gals, and you should be good to go. Uh, this whole video was recorded using the rear-facing 12-megapixel camera on the Samsung Galaxy S8 in 720p resolution at 30 frames per second. And all the audio for this video here today, as long-winded as it was, yes I know, I apologize, was recorded using the Comica V30 Lite shotgun style microphone. So please let me know what you think of the overall video and audio quality down below in the comments. I hope everyone has a great day and I will catch you guys and gals in my next video. Peace everyone.